you all hear me good. Give me a nod. Great. Hey, thank you. I'm going to welcome everybody here this morning. This is our second day. For those of you who had a chance to join us yesterday, it was a great day. We had uh, not only a lot of great panels, but uh, we had a visit from Sherrod Brown in the morning and a visit from Governor DeWine in the afternoon, which was a lot of fun. And I hear Rob Portman might try to stop in today, but um, this is a really important panel. I've been looking forward to this conversation. There are some great panelists. Uh, I wanted to do one housekeeping to let you know that during the course of this session, you're going to be asked to respond to a poll. And it doesn't matter if you get the questions right or wrong, but this is because this is a CLE, Continuing Legal Education course offered by the Ohio Supreme Court. Lawyers on it have to uh, respond to the poll three times during the course of the hour to prove to the Ohio Supreme Court that they are indeed listening. Uh, Imagine you can train a dog to do that and you can still get the credit from the Supreme Court. But in any event, we're going to respond to it three times. And um, it's my honor now to introduce a person I've been working with for many years, Jerry Paffendorf with Loveland Technologies. We have used Jerry's products in cities all over Ohio. Uh, he's been a great partner. Um, love the guy. Uh, normally, I get really nervous around very tall people. Jerry's about six foot six. But when he's around me, he always uh, is kind enough to stoop and I feel a whole lot better. So Jerry, this is yours and please do the intro. Well, I appreciate it. So I, actually, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna keep this brief and hand this over to Will, who's our fearless leader on the panel. So I'll, I'll just take a moment. Uh, thank you, Jim. I, I guess I can say I love you too. Sounds a little weird to profess that publicly, but um, there it is on the table for all to see. Um, so I, mostly I just want to quickly express gratitude. Um, Jim and I and our teams um, have been doing projects together since 2015. Uh, property mapping, property data projects in, in Cleveland and across Ohio. And um, just really looking forward to deepening those relationships and, and continuing to work with land banks across the state. I also just want to take a moment to express, um, uh, to just ex ex express my gratitude for all the work that Robin Thomas had done over the years too. And I'm really happy to see this event honoring her. And I know that her memory and legacy is going to go on for a long time in, in the land bank community and, and, in, and in more communities across Ohio. Um, so no commercial here. I mean, if, if you guys are familiar with Loveland's work, we believe that everybody should have access to great property data, great property mapping tools, and you can check out our work at landgrid.com if you haven't seen it before. And um, I'm looking forward to this panel because it, the topic is spot on. COVID is accelerating a lot of changes that have been happening in the world already, and how we can prepare for them um, is one of the most important topics that, that there is right now. So. Um, I think with that, Will, I'll hand it over to you and let's hop into this session. Sounds great. Thanks, Jerry. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Basil, Land Bank Manager here in Hamilton County. And um, I just want to echo Jerry and honoring Robert with this conference. I think, Jim, you know, you guys did a great job in just um, putting this conference together and filling some really big shoes. So um, it was just well done, especially in light of it being virtual and all the nuances with that. So just a great job with, with this. Um, Today, we have a fantastic panel of speakers that I'm honored to share um, the virtual stage with today. And we'll also spend some time at the, at the end uh, opening it up for questions. Um, today, you'll be hearing from uh, folks around the state who are going to talk about the importance of using data to drive decisions, um, updates on how COVID has impacted our communities and some of our work already. And we also hope that you'll take some ideas from the session back to your team and figure out what kind of key indicators you should be tracking in your communities. Um, today, I'm honored to be joined by uh, Frank Ford, Senior Policy Advisor with the Western Reserve Land Conservancy, Bill Faith, Executive Director of uh, the Coalition of Homeless and Housing in Ohio, Jerry Paffendorf, CEO and um, Co-Founder of Loveland Technologies, Ann Wisto, Vice President of Projects and Planning with Lucas County Land Bank, and we also have with us today in the background Isaac Robb from the Western Reserve Land Conservancy, who's helping us monitor the chat for questions and was helpful in setting up this panel. Um, before we get started, I felt the need to really share my personal take on why our work is so important, um, especially in light of the news coming out of Louisville yesterday and the things that we've seen happening around our country this year. It is clear more than ever that there are many broken, broken and hurting communities right now. And if you're like me and you're in the business of helping fix broken communities, um, then we have to start thinking about more ways to put our focus on the people who live there and not just the property. Um, and I know this isn't true for everyone in Ohio, but at least here in Cincinnati and in Hamilton County, um, I, as a white male, don't always represent the people who live in most of the communities that we work in. Um, if this session and really the year that is 2020 teaches us anything, it's that we need to continue to build strong communities. Um, but in order to do that, we need to build strong partnerships and strong relationships. 
Um, we should continue not only sharing our financial resources through rehabs, stabilizations, demolitions, et cetera, but also through leveraging our relationships with elected officials, with lenders and nonprofits to bring more resources like rental assistance and foreclosure prevention um, to the residents of our communities. It's one thing to use data to make decisions, uh, but to really make a lasting impact, we should find more ways to share that data with communities. Um, you'll hear a little bit later on about how that's being done through LandGrid, um, Loveland Technology. So again, thank you, Jerry, um, for um, sponsoring this panel and also for being willing to share your thoughts on how COVID is impacting our work. Um, so we hope to keep today's session interesting this morning so you all don't run out of coffee or tea too, too soon. Um, and also, like Jim mentioned, this is going to be eligible for, for CLE credits. So we'll be asking our first polling question here. Um, so before I turn it over to Frank, let's go ahead and get that um, first polling question out of the way. Um, so at this point in time, what level of disruption is COVID-19 having on economic conditions for people and the communities you serve? All right, Frank, I think uh, you're up. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, one of the descriptions in the description of the session, one of the questions that was posed is how can land banks stay ahead or keep ahead of the COVID-19 crisis with respect to housing, disruption of the housing markets in their communities. And I think that one of the things we hope to do today is demonstrate to you that you can do that in part by using available data uh, to track and monitor what's happening. And we're gonna walk through some examples of that. Both Cleveland and Cincinnati uh, have provided examples of data that they're tracking. And uh, I'm gonna start with that. Although I do have one quick housekeeping thing for myself. Uh, I, I did uh, forget to download the virtual tool for advancing slides. And I'm wondering if Ke Kelly or Madison um, could advance the slides for me. Um, we can go to the next one if somebody could do that. And I apologize for that. Um, okay, that's good, thank you. So the, the premise that we're starting with is that until the COVID-19 pandemic is brought under control, we can expect continued economic disruption in the form of businesses closed or scaled back, which means lost revenue and wages, and it means families unable to pay monthly bills. Of the monthly bills that people may not be able to pay, there are three that are significant in terms of their impact on housing markets, inability to pay mortgage payments, property tax payments, and rent payments. Next slide. So we're gonna start with looking at the, some of the indicators that Hamilton County has been tracking, and then I'll move to Cuyahoga County and Cleveland, and they will be similar. Uh, so starting with mortgage foreclosure, what you'll see is that um, uh, 2019 is the blue line for mortgage foreclosure activity. Uh, in this uh, same period of January through August. And then the red line is this year. And you can see the dramatic decrease starting around March, April and continuing. And that is likely due to uh, moratoriums on foreclosure, um, federal intervention in terms of forbearance programs, things like that. Next slide. And tax foreclosure filings, uh, actually the patterns are similar, but the level is changed. In blue, again, you have 2019, and then in red, you have the current year, which is a reduction of uh, tax foreclosure in this year, actually pretty much throughout the year, with sig their significant dips. Uh, yeah, and actually, and I'm not sure whether, given that the patterns are almost identical in both years, uh, other than the fact that the numbers are down significantly, uh, particularly in the second, uh, second quarter, um, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it at that. Next slide. So here are evictions in Hamilton County. This includes Cincinnati and suburban evictions. And you can see that there is a fairly steady level in the first uh, August uh, of 2019 through February, January of 2019, around 1100, between 900 and 1100. And then it drops dramatically in the spring, uh, March, April, uh, but it's coming back up. It hasn't come back up to the previous levels, but it is coming back up. Uh, I'm gonna switch now. Next slide starts with the uh, Cuyahoga County information. 
The mortgage foreclosure filing data is almost identical to the experience in Cincinnati, Hamilton County. The blue line is 2019. The red line is 2020. And you see, just like with Hamilton County, a dramatic decrease in foreclosures, which is continuing. Um, this, uh, this data I just noticed goes through July. I think the Hamilton went through August, but it's virtually an identical pattern. Uh, next slide. So in Cuyahoga County, we did do something a little bit different. Um, we added the 90-day mortgage delinquency that is available from the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland. I do believe that any county in Ohio could probably ask for this and get it. Um, the red line is Cuyahoga, the green line is Ohio, the blue line is United States, and the delinquency rate, as you can see, was fairly low at about 2% then has a dramatic increase in people being delinquent 90 days or more on their mortgages starting uh, around uh, March, April. Uh, next slide. Now there's a little bit of a nuance to this. Uh, we also have data that breaks this down into three subgroups. 30 to 59 days is the blue line. 60 to 89 day delinquency is the um, red line and then 90 plus is the green line. There is uh, a different story here because you see that the shorter delinquencies peaked um, in March of the uh, 50, 30, excuse me, 30 to 59 peaked in March or maybe April and then it's come down. The 60 to 89 day delinquency peaked about a month later and has come down. Meanwhile, the 90-day delinquencies are still high, although you notice there's a trend where they're tapering off. So the question is, if the 30 and if the shorter delinquencies continue to stay low, that has to mean that the 90-day delinquencies are going to come down as well. This is not what I would have expected, um, and I don't know whether we can assume that this means the crisis of mortgage foreclosure that people have been predicting. I don't know that we can assume that's not going to happen because consider two things: one. In March, April, uh, people got their $1,200 stimulus check. And starting in April, uh, people were able to get their $600 a week unemployment benefit, which I believe ran out in July. So both the stimulus checks, unless they get repeated, which I others on this uh, session may know better than I do, but it could suggest that these are a blip a short-term benefit that people got. And so this is something I'm gonna be keeping my eye on. I hope to be getting the next data. The data is a little bit behind from the Federal Reserve, but I hope to be looking at this again and keep, keep an eye on it closely. Um, next slide. Tax delinquency, we did something a little bit different in Cuyahoga. We didn't track uh, the filings of foreclosures yet, although we actually can do that. What we wanted to present here is just a uh, longer term pattern. You can see for 10 years, residential tax delinquency has been, the average delinquency has doubled over the last 10 years. Next slide. And the number of parcels though, good news is that that has not gone up dramatically. In fact, it's actually started to come down. And that's because three years ago, there was a collaboration between housing advocates and the county treasury. Uh, to help people get on payment plans. And that's been incredibly successful. And you can see the results of that. Next slide. The last slide here is the gross delinquency, which as with the average was increasing dramatically from 90 million up to 238 million. But you'll notice in the last year, that's now coming down for the first time. So the big question is uh, in the coming months, what will the impact of COVID-19 be on this? Uh, will people, when taxes become due, will they not pay? And taxes have been deferred or in Cuyahoga County, they've been pushed back. Um, I, I actually, I should know the date of this, but I'm, I, I don't know it. I can't remember offhand how far it's been pushed back. So I think I'm actually done with my part of the presentation. And let's go to the next slide and I will introduce, oh, sorry, one more. Eviction filings, which is virtually identical to the Hamilton County data, the only difference is that this is Cleveland municipal data only. This is not Cleveland as Cuyahoga County suburbs, but there's a virtually identical pattern where you've got a dramatic drop as moratoriums were in effect uh, at the Cleveland Housing Court through March, April, May, and then those moratoriums were lifted 
in uh, June. And so filings are back up, but as with Hamilton County, they're not quite back up to the level they were. I believe this is my last slide. Go to the next one and I'll transition. So Bill Faith is the director of the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio will give us sort of the 20,000 foot level view of state and federal policy intervention and resources available. Bill, it's up to you now. Thanks, Frank. Um, it's good to be with everybody this morning. I do want to just do a quick overview of some of the housing insecurity issues that Frank talked about and how that's uh, beginning to play out. And I'm sure you all know we had a big housing problem before COVID. I mean, one of the one of the indicators of that that I like to focus on is that we had more than 400,000 households in Ohio that were spending over half of their income on on rent, the um, or or other housing costs. So it, in the Pandemic with all the uh, layoffs and all the reduction in income hit hit those that were at the lowest income levels um, the hardest and and as Frank pointed out we had significant unemployment claims since the COVID hit I think we're up to over 1.7 million unemployment claims um, there are still over uh, 350 thousand people that are receiving unemployment. And as Frank also pointed out, there was a federal supplement to unemployment of $600 a week that ended in July. Um, however, the state uh, worked with the new uh, federal initiative and they've been uh, able to get $300 a supplement, $300 a week in supplemental unemployment benefits that are beginning to be distributed uh, to people currently. So that it will be for only for six weeks that'll end. Actually, it's already ended, even though it just started because it, uh, but it will cover uh, up to six weeks. So as Frank also pointed out, the, the eviction rates that he indicated for a couple of our communities are pretty steady across the board. Um, it, evictions are not up to where they were last year. Uh, there certainly the moratorium on federal properties, uh, federally uh, financed properties certainly impacted that. And also we had the courts in many cases around the state uh, closed down and weren't processing evictions uh, for many weeks. That is all resumed and uh, we're beginning to see evictions creep up as, as Frank's data pointed out. I think the other thing to point out is that you know, Matt Desmond, who wrote the book Evicted, points out that the rent eats first. And I think I'm always amazed at how resourceful people are of keeping a roof over their head. And I think there's been some recent data um, that just came out this week from uh, Apartment List, is the name of the outfit, that shows that 63% of tenants have withdrawn from savings retirement accounts, borrowed from family or friends, sold assets, or have been using their credit cards uh, to make their rent payments. So that's part of what is happening is why we're not seeing more people um, hit the eviction list. Um, and similarly, we've seen homeowners continue to pay their mortgages at a pretty, I mean, as a level that I think is higher than I had expected, like Frank also said, but still, uh, according to the apartment list, 7% uh, have failed to make a full mortgage payment uh, in August. And certainly that'll probably be worse in September. Um, where we're seeing the big increases is primarily in class C properties. Um, so, you know, we've seen numbers creep up over the summer as more people are finding it difficult uh, to keep the rent paid. So we've been very engaged in trying to work on solutions or at least some remedies for this. We work with Sherrod Brown on proposing a, uh, he proposed a $100 billion emergency rental assistance program, which was in fact included in the HEROES Act that the House passed. But as everybody knows, the Senate leaders took a different approach and it did not come to the table to uh, get a package um, agreed to. And now with the Ginsburg, uh, Ginsburg passing and the, all, the, all the fighting going on about her replacement, 
Um, I'm sure that will prevent any deal on coronavirus relief anytime soon. So we also have turned our attention to the state level. Um, we did put together a sign-on letter, 182 groups across the board, uh, pressed the governor to provide uh, money out of the coronavirus relief fund that the state controls or from CDBG or from anything else. We asked for $100 million and so far, uh, the governor has just not acted on that. Um, the bottom line is uh, we are still continuing to press the case. They do have money available through the coronavirus relief fund. They have about 50 some million available in CDBG money that the state controls. So we're continuing to press that case. But surprisingly, the uh, CDC uh, issued a moratorium um, on evictions from residential property that uh, we nobody really saw coming. This isn't a self-executing um, moratorium. It's a it, it, the tenants would have to assert uh, that they are eligible for this, um, and really it does apply to any any uh, any non-payment situation in a in a rental situation they, they do have to submit a um, declaration to their landlord which they may also need to provide to the court if they actually get an eviction hearing um, the bottom line is they have to attest that several different things uh, are true in their case that they made best efforts to seek out assistance uh, from the government they've been able uh, unable to pay rent to, due to a sudden loss of household income, um, which you know, is true in most cases. They also have to make less than 99000 a year, which is not going to be a problem for most people. And that if they don't get relief or, or if they don't qualify for the moratorium, then they will, will become homeless or have to live in close quarters with others, um, you know, in a doubled up situation. I mean, it, the CDC is reinforcing um, something that we have been saying for a long time, that housing is a health issue. So if people are in precarious housing situations or losing their housing, it, it creates risk for them uh, in contracting the virus and through a homeless shelter, living on the streets, or in a double, doubled up situation. So meanwhile, we're continuing to press the case with the DeWine administration and I remain hopeful that uh, they will come to the table and provide some relief uh, for rental assistance. There are many, many programs that have sprung up in the recent weeks to, to establish uh, rental assistance at the local level. They've been using a wide range of resources like their own CDBG or their own, the coronavirus relief money that they control and a variety of other resources to fund that. But frankly, they're running low on funds already, and we're, we're, we have a long way to go to get out of the woods on this. So I would encourage you to support pressing the case with the DeWine administration and with our federal officials going forward, uh, because unless we deal with this rental assistance and mortgage assistance efforts, uh, this, this problem is just going to get out of control. So I want to... Uh, stop and pass it back to Jerry, who's going to provide great data and more information on, on the land bank situation. Thank you, Bill. And uh, first, uh, like Frank, I need someone to advance my slides. I'm definitely Zoom literate, but I'm not quite that fancy yet. So I'll say uh, next slide. Um, and off the top, I do want to uh, echo Will and what he said at the beginning, and then um, Bill's content as well. But I think the focus here moving into the future um, should really be on more ways to put the focus back on people, not just the property. Um, so when you hear me talk about data, I always try to bring it back around to how the data can be used to reach people, uh, to inform everybody of what's going on, and to, to personally reach people in vulnerable situations early. So how do you use the data, not just to understand things yourself, but then to do outreach, to talk to people, to listen, to have empathy, and to offer assistance. Um, and in general, I also think, I know Will brought up situations happening across the country, 
And I do feel like where land banks and property ownership intersect with that is it's so important to have a focus on encouraging local ownership because when people don't own their own communities, that has so many implications up and down the line. So uh, in my time today, uh, I want to introduce the notion that you can take uh, time series information and graphs like the graphs that Frank showed and actually make them not just lines on a chart, but get all the address information that what are the properties that are in that bundle of how many foreclosures there are and how many evictions there are and how much tax delinquency there are and actually turn that into both maps and lists of precisely which properties are at risk where and to have that data consistently flow and update and then to be able to use that information to reach people and create interventions early rather than responding to things um, later on. So uh, next slide, please. So this is what uh, a lot of us have been looking at every day or every week since March, right? Like the whole country and the whole world has actually been tuned into to time series information. Everybody's interested in how many infections there are, how many deaths there are, what's changing day by day, how have, how have our transformed lifestyles contributed to flattening the curve or reducing the numbers? Uh, next slide, please. And so what I want to talk about here is how can we actually get into this kind of time series flow with property information uh, now that everybody's brain is pretty much tuned to like, no, I know you can do stuff with data over time. I see it on the news every day. The charts are always updated. So how do we start to do that and bring that into our work? Next slide, please. So I've spoken at a couple uh, Ohio Land Bank conferences uh, previously. I feel like my job is to always mix in like one or two like weird references that typically wouldn't show up at a land bank conference. So I was trying to like think of like, what was my favorite analogy for like why it's important to be able to see in time and not just snapshots. And so um, Kurt Vonnegut's book, Slaughterhouse-Five, kind of floated back into my brain. Um, in that book, a World War II veteran is uh, visited by aliens who can see in four dimensions, okay? So bear with me on this. So when they look around the world, they see the positions of everything, past, future, present, obviously gives them a different take on things. And when they look at humans and when they think about how a human perceives the world, they use this illusion or this analogy where here's this poor guy, Billy, who's got a big steel sphere over his head and he's got six feet of pipe that he looks through. So he's just kind of seeing this dot in the world. And whatever Billy's like brought to look at, whatever that dot is, that's just reality for him. And I, I have to say, as somebody who has evangelized and, and worked with property information and talked about the importance of having great data, um, I feel the same way often when I'm just looking at snapshots of data, right? Everybody's familiar with getting like, okay, give me the latest cut of this. What do we own? What's at risk? Okay. Boom, we got it on an interactive map. We got it on a PDF, like there it is. And what we miss entirely is this sense of motion of how things are changing. And so what I wanna help us think about is how do we get the steel sphere off of our head and maybe at least widen you know, the width of that pipe. Um, next slide, please. And one more you know, kind, of, kind of illusion here. Um, you know, this, this also came to mind. This is uh, Edward Moybridge's uh, photo series of a horse running. And um, this came to mind because this was uh, from uh, 1878. And at this point in time, photography was new. And the way that, uh, how fast the horse is and how, how the human eye works, it was actually controversial. And uh, people betting on both sides, does a horse take all four hooves off the ground at the same time or not? And you could have people literally watching the horse and seeing it both ways. And so Moybridge set up this series of trip wires and 16 cameras. So as the horse ran, it actually tripped the wires. All the photos were taken. It was put together. And lo and behold, finally it was settled. The horse took all four hooves off the ground. And this came to mind because when we think about tracking things through time, we think about what we know and what we don't know. Even if we're pretty confident, if we think how things work and property and sales transactions and mortgages and what happens with property tax collection, until we really set these trip wires and start to look at what's taking place, we have some basic misunderstandings, okay, that may be analogous to something that's like, huh, I never know the animal of my community kind of moved that way, and now that I do, I've got a greater insight. Uh, next slide, please. So I wish I could give a, a quick interactive demo in this. I can't, so I'm going to kind of talk around the, the slides, but I want to talk briefly about sort of the first um, success 
um, and first interfaces that we've been putting together around time series data. And this is something I think that's a very, uh, I want to introduce some practical data sets that land banks can get access to that will be very important for the work that we all do. So um, we're based in Detroit, Michigan, and we've been tracking uh, tax foreclosure and property tax delinquency there for, and, and helping to solve that problem uh, for longer than I care to admit, okay? But for the last couple of years, we have been recording citywide snapshots every two weeks of tax delinquency for every parcel in Detroit. And so at this point in time, we have a very structured data set of the tax delinquency for about 400,000 parcels going back for about two years. And we've been able to put this into an interface where you can see overall aggregate changes over time, you know, along the lines of what, um, what Frank showed earlier, where you can kind of see the line changing. How does, how does 2020 compare to 2019? How does it compare month to month between those two years? And what we can see in Detroit happening right now, and it's kind of fluctuating, it's interesting, it's kind of fluctuating month to month, where you're kind of seeing that 2020 has a five to 10% increase in tax delinquency and overall numbers of tax delinquent um, properties this year compared to last year. And um, uh, next slide, please. And so what you can sort of see, it's small in the interface here, so forgive me, but um, what we built into this is not just seeing the aggregate, but having the ability to actually punch down into particular property types and see them on the map. So it's very interesting to know what the aggregate amount of overdue taxes is, but it becomes even more compelling and useful for particular programs and actions when you can break that down into things like, show me a tax delinquency for every homeowner occupied property in the city. Show me tax delinquency for every renter property in the city. Show me tax delinquency for every commercial property in the city. Show me tax delinquency for every unoccupied building in the city. Because you all know that each one of those property types has a different kind of intervention or action or understanding or outreach that's associated with them. You'll treat a homeowner occupant who's behind much differently than you treat an investor property which is vacant and the owner is somewhere else versus a vacant property which might be you know, in an occupied property, you want to work to keep somebody in that home. With a vacant property, you might be looking at that as, a, as, a, as an acquisition. So being able to see how all these things change granularly. Um, next slide, please. And these are just kind of views. So this is like, you know, all of the homeowner occupied properties that are behind on property taxes. Next slide, please. And then um, moving on to different types, commercial and so on. You can flip to the next slide. Uh, and this is just a view of uh, individual property. So next slide, please. So other kinds of data, uh, time series data, which are, are kind of newly available. Okay, I'm gonna talk about one which is just kind of newly available in general. And then one which I kind of feel like people don't really believe that you can actually get granular access to, which is the uh, mortgage uh, foreclosure data as it kind of moves to the pipeline. But um, real quick here, one of, one of the companies that we partnered with recently is a company called SafeGraph. And they provide, they actually have a data set of foot traffic to businesses across the country. And this comes from opt-in apps that people download on their phones where they can share anonymous aggregated information about businesses that they visit. And so SafeGraph has been in the news a bunch recently because with COVID, obviously everybody has been looking to see what is changing as people shelter in place and social distance and, and can't, go into indoor, can't go indoors, can't go into gatherings of a certain size. Uh, next slide, please. So they've actually, uh, this is state level, but you can actually break this stuff out to like neighborhood level, changes over time and foot traffic to different kinds of businesses. So on the right hand side, they're small, you're seeing traffic to different kinds of businesses, restaurants, movie theaters, et cetera. And this can get really granular. And I think this is, easy enough to consume, it might be something that land banks haven't really thought about before, which neighborhoods and which commercial corridors are seeing activity, which ones aren't. And this is like constantly updated in the full stream. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have been doing a, a better job reaching out to companies like CoreLogic and Atom Data, who um, sometimes I feel like they float in like a rarefied level. Um, they can, I don't wanna say that they're hard to work with. It's a more opaque data set to get at mortgage foreclosures and mortgage foreclosure um, risk. So like from the earliest steps of a mortgage foreclosure action 
or a delinquency on payment before the mortgage foreclosure occurs. We have some relationships that make it affordable and fairly straightforward for land banks to consume um, this information into your data processes. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about this. This is essentially like, you know, like the, the tax delinquency time series I was talking about before mortgage foreclosure risk. So all these different steps, being able to see in your communities when somebody's fallen behind and when somebody has started that first step in the legal process of the foreclosure step. And the, the data is actually pretty phenomenal. I mean, you can see the who got the loan, who gave the loan. And I know we've riffed on, on this with Jim and others in the past that, you know, if you start to see large scale uh, mortgage delinquency and a brewing uh, mortgage foreclosure problem, it's not only possible to reach the party in, in the household before it happens, but it's also conceivably possible to communicate with the lenders, the holders of these loans who are gonna be making decisions about what to do. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just to show you, yeah, we've, we've consumed some of the core logic mortgage data put this into an interface, mixed it with other property information, and it works really well. It fits nicely, and it lets you see which properties are at risk of, of, of possibly going down that aisle where we don't wanna see them going. Uh, next slide, please. And then to wrap up uh, my section and kind of mix this with like, okay, so if you have this kind of information, like what's the thing that you could kind of do with it to like reach people and, and learn more? And so I just wanna uh, quickly reference one of the, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that there's a a number of projects that could all almost tie for like project that I'm the proudest that you know we worked on. But one, one that I'm particularly proud of is a project in Detroit called Neighbor to Neighbor. Um, it's, it's funded and supported in large part by Quicken Loans and their local community uh, fund in Detroit. And it works with housing counselors. It works with neighborhood groups across the city. Uh, next slide, please. To actually take the data about who's behind in their property taxes, do some of that filtering for who are the homeowner occupants, who do we think are the renters, but actually physically train and work with neighbors to go out, knock on those doors, deliver helpful information. So deliver paper information, different programs, different ways to pay, um, just a greater understanding of what the situation is with information tailored to whether or not it's a homeowner, whether or not it's a renter. And then to not only administer hey, here are the programs that most apply to you. Here's information about the situation that's happening right now, but to also administer uh, an optional interview and to listen about why, why is the situation happening? What are the circumstances in the home? Does the home need any major repairs? Things that may be contributing factors to why the delinquency is occurring. Uh, next slide, please. And um, uh, I will, so in this, just to go over some quick stats from this, they've gone through, um, each of the last two years visited about 60,000 uh, homes that are tax delinquent in the city and talked to about uh, 17 to 20,000 uh, people. I think last year, this year they interviewed, uh, 2019 they interviewed 14,000 homeowners and learned so much about which programs were working and which programs weren't working and found things like more than 55% of the people that they talked to actually qualified for programs that existed that would help them with their taxes that they were not aware of. And so I think this blending of data with the human outreach and the community partnerships to actually try to get to people early, which is something you can understand through time series data, is probably one of the most powerful approaches that I've seen. And it really humanizes things. And I think it starts to move in that direction that Will brought up at the front end of the talk. And that Bill talked about in, in all the ways that people can get assistance and are at risk. And everybody's trying to figure out how to do it, how to get to them, how much money is needed, what's the right approach. Sometimes it can be as simple as, um, none of it's simple, but it can be as simple or a great start is, is, is realizing you can actually go and like talk to people and listen and involve them and their neighbors in the process. So um, with all of that uh, said, um, I'm gonna pass this off now to our next panelist, who is Ann Wisto, the VP of Projects and Planning at the Lucas County Land Bank. And there's two more slides, I think, or a few more to, to jump past to get to Ann, so forgive me. Well, I think that you're, oh, did you want to do the question first or? Oh yeah, let's go ahead and just ask that second, just flash the second polling question up. Yeah. So uh, what types of data are most important for your work um, slash the work of your organization?
All right, Anne, it's all yours. Okay. I'm gonna try to do the internet clicker, but if I need help, I may just just yell. So, <laughs> um, okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, the panelists so far have covered a lot of the overarching trends that we are seeing throughout the region and how COVID-19 is impacting our communities. So I'm gonna spend a little time today discussing exactly what we are experiencing in Lucas County and then go into how we are using the data and technology to navigate these challenging times. Okay, it worked. Um, I am sure this comes as no surprise to anyone in the room here, but our acquisition in 2020 has decreased dramatically compared to years prior due to the court ordered moratorium. Since July, uh, new foreclosures have been able to be filed only on vacant and abandoned properties though. We hope to acquire an additional 150 parcels by the end of the year, um, but as I'll show in the next slide, this is significantly lower than what we are used to seeing. The other item that we've been keeping a close eye on this year is our budget, but following July collection, we are projected to exceed last year's DTAC. We are routinely discussing why this may be. Um, will this remain true in 2022? One, I know that the previous panelists have touched on this a little bit, um, but a good question to be thinking about is, are people prioritizing their home and property taxes because of the stay at home orders, because we're encouraged to be home, to stay away from people? Perhaps are these lessons that we learned from the 2008 foreclosure crisis? Um, I know Bill touched on this a little bit, but it's hard to imagine that we won't see a dip in payments if folks don't receive any additional relief um, from the government. Um, and I'm happy to hear that we're thinking about that on the state level as well as, as we know the federal um, government has not been able to do anything to date. Um, we ha also have been able to keep up with property sales, which has been pretty impressive, but with a lower number of acquisitions coming our way, we inevitably will see our property sales numbers decline um, hopefully not for too long, but um, I think it is good to acknowledge that and prepare for what's to come. As you can see here, we acquired more than a thousand parcels in 2017, followed by roughly 900 in 2018 and again in 2019. But as of August 31st, we've only acquired 63 parcels this year. We are hopeful now that we can proceed with acquiring abandoned structures and vacant lots, that the number will start to increase. Uh, but with the filings just happening, as you all know, that the process does take time. I apologize that I forgot to include the money sign here, um, but what this is showing is the increase in DTAC over the last four years. In 2017, we collected 1.25 million. And then in 2018 and 2019, it was closer to 1.35. And then right now we are projecting to receive a little more than 1.5 million in 2020. So again, um, we're not taking that for granted though, knowing that what is expected to come um, due to the, the pandemic here. Okay, now on to the data impact here. So the main reason we have been able to weather the changes that the pandemic has presented us is because of our routine collection and use of data. Um, the data, the technology that we have implemented over the years has allowed us to adjust to a work from home environment um, where we can share and collect data still routinely with our partners throughout the county um, and cities uh, in order to update current information, not only internally um, amongst our land bank, but also externally. Uh, you'll see on this list here that most of the data sets are, is, comes from public resources, uh, in addition to uh, the information that we get from land grid um, that, in Loveland that Jerry just touched on at the end of his presentation there and what they provide us. Uh, the last thing here that I just wanna point out is our 2015 parcel survey. Uh, we do use that with the understanding that it is now five years old, but um, I will touch on that a little bit uh, towards the end of the presentation here. So 
Sorry, I lost my internet connection to my clicker. Can I ask for the next slide? Thank you. Um, okay, the importance of layering data. I know I'm, I get a little nerdy about this because it's so exciting to me, but um, hopefully the visuals will help for people that are more interested in that. But um, knowledge is power. It does make us stronger. It makes us better at what we do. Um, complete and real-time data sets are important by themselves, but with the ability to layer that data onto a mapping tool allows for spatial analysis. Um, here's a screenshot of a map we are currently uh, using through LandGrid. I'm really happy that Jerry spent uh, a second showing you exactly what we see on the parcel layer so you can get a better understanding of that. So um, this is the whole county and you can see where the city is, but um, with, with land grids tools, we are able to do that granular uh, interpretation as well. So what you're seeing here is the different colors represent different levels of tax delinquency and residential structures. Uh, we use not only the year uh, that they were certified tax delinquent, but also the amount. And then we go ahead and also take it one layer further and use the percentage um, of value. So if you're a you know oh thirty thousand on a ninety thousand dollar house, you know that's going to show that that's one third um, of your value you are behind. Uh, so Loveland gives us that opportunity to look at that in such a discreet, um, discreet opportunity there. So uh, the image is hard to tell, but you know we do use this daily when we're completing our investigations. And if anybody has any further questions about our data sets and how we use that and how we work with uh, Loveland here, I'm more than happy to answer those questions for you separately, uh, but I don't wanna don't want to labor on that too much. So um, over the years, our relationship with Loveland has really grown. Um, like many of you, we have a very small staff, so we rely on this data and technology uh, to complete our day-to-day -day work. Okay. Next slide, please. The last point I want to make was that no matter how strong your quantitative data is, de decisions should not be made without community buy-in. Um, we work diligently to collaborate with as many community partners as possible. Um, in addition to uh, those groups, we also work with local municipalities, neighborhood groups, and our board of directors. Um, also, while data is so very important, it is crucial to remember to always prioritize your mission when working through decisions. And then, so what's next? Um, we are currently working to finalize our survey tool to update our 2015 citywide survey. We hope to start in March and then wrap up around this time next year. This is real time where we met about it yesterday. We're really excited. So um, hopefully next year we can share more about that. Uh, and then lastly, um, we will just continue to collect and analyze data uh, to help us prepare for the coming years. Uh, all the data that we've seen here today is really important and crucial uh, for what 2021 and beyond will bring us. So I think that's it. That wraps up my portion of the presentation and I'm not gonna pass it over to Will to finish this out. Thanks, Ann. Um, I'm also gonna try to do these slides myself, um, but definitely thanks for Rock the House for your help and just putting on this, this whole um, conference together. It's been pretty amazing just to kind of see some of the behind the scenes things. So quick shout out to them. Um, so what, what is next? Um, you know, we just heard from a lot of great folks around the, around the, um, the state and, and the country. Um, we throw a lot of data information at you. And so I hope what you take away is just how important data can be um, and how important it is to have collaboration uh, between organizations. You know, we really can't do this work in a vacuum. Um, one of the things that I will we'll leave with you is kind of a matrix of indicators that we've created. We, we put together our thoughts to say, what are the things that we track as land banks or as, as organizations that deal with data and property and communities? Um, so this is not the end all be all of indicators, but there are data points that we think are useful for land banks, especially to track. Um, you know, we know each community is different. And so what works in one area may not work in another. Um, so we encourage you to kind of review this um, and create a list of your own or matrix of your own. Um, also, most of these um, indicators are easily mappable so that you can, you know, put them on a map, which is very um, helpful when you're making decisions about how to deploy your resources. Um, and we'll send this out separately in a higher res um, version so you actually have a, a chance to, to look at it. Um, 
So a few things before we jump into the questions, because we do already have a, um, one good question um, teed up. Um, what's next? So, you know, again, review the indicators. Um, also, we encourage you to take some time to reach out to other organizations um, in your communities, um, CDCs, local governments, nonprofits, lenders, uh, just anyone who's really kind of doing the boots on the groundwork to share and gather information with them. Um, in Hamilton County, we work very closely with our CDC partners, the Community Development Corporations. Um, to not just hold properties on their behalf so they can put together development plans, go after financing, attract developers, but also just to share information with them and help them um, and have them help inform our work. So we found that, you know, partnering with CDCs and nonprofits is a really useful thing to do. Um, also, um, in, we encourage others to join or create, you know, committees or coalitions. Um, some of the bigger ones that you might be familiar with are, you know, VAPAC up in Cleveland, which is really working on big, big global issues. Um, GOPC steering committee, kind of a more of a statewide thing. Um, in Hamilton County, we have a quality housing task force, which is comprised of the land bank, legal aid, the city, lenders, a lot of folks, um, and in Dayton, they have a data committee that's really um, comprised of, you know, Montgomery County land bank, the city of Dayton, a lot of folks there. Um, so if you don't have a coalition or if you know of some that are, that are out there, we definitely encourage you to get involved in, and start those. Um, but lastly, we just wanted to leave you with that you don't have to be an expert in data. You, know, you don't have to be a data scientist or have a degree in, in data specifically. Um, you just need someone who can be a project manager and you can really help um, ask the questions, who, who knows what they don't know, who can pull in the people who are the subject matter experts to help fill in the gaps. Um, again, just wanna highlight the work that Montgomery County's Land Bank is doing. Um, they're partnering with the city of Dayton who has, um, was selected for the Bloomberg Initiative. So they're really getting a lot of resources to really help build out um, a really robust um, data resource toolkit that they really help hope that they can use um, not just in Dayton, but in other municipalities because they're starting to ask the question, you know, do land banks have a role in helping smaller jurisdictions who have limited resources with record keeping, with data collection, with mapping? Um, so that's something just to keep in the back of your mind, no matter where you're at, that, um, you know, there could be ways for you to be, be more engaged in the communities um, that you work in. Um, so again, we're gonna ask this last polling question, um, but if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we do have one we'll answer right now, but as we go through this last question, feel free to, to pull up, um, type in some questions. So last question, um, how long do you anticipate any negative impacts from COVID-19 to last in the communities you're ser you serve? Give a second to answer that. Um, okay, so so lastly, um, we want to answer some questions, but we also would like to highlight some work if, if you are doing any work. Um, you know, what are you doing in your respective counties or communities that's different than before COVID-19? Are you thinking about new creative programs, new strategies? Um, are you relocating funding to help solve a specific issue that you weren't focused on before? Um, so if anyone has examples, we'd love to highlight those. Otherwise, we'll continue to, to answer some questions and um, we'll start with this first one. Um, the question is, is there a chance for land banks to take occupied structures as a way of keeping people in residential units? Up until now, land banks have avoided taking occupied structures. Is, is it worth reconsidering this policy? Um, I think that's a great question. I don't know if um, anyone would like to, to start to answer that. I think it's one thing that we, we kind of talked about a little bit of, you know, what role could land banks play? I know that there might be some um, statutory requirements for regulation as how many occupied structures land banks can own, but I think it's something to consider if there's a way for positive ownership um, for land banks to get involved in that. that. That's an interesting idea. I don't know, does anyone on the panel have any thoughts about, about that question? I can jump in. Um, I know that this is something that's going to come up frequently. Um, we actually just had our homelessness board uh, contact us within the last couple of weeks about um, options and um, I don't know who mentioned that um, that this is also a health crisis, housing can be. Uh, so I do think that that's how this intersects. And I don't know what that looks like necessarily for us in Lucas County, but we certainly are having those conversations and are aware that uh, we can play a role in helping with that. I'm always wary of uh, directly diving into like what land banks should do on that level because I don't 
you know, I've never worked directly at a land bank and so I don't have those full like pressures and, and, and policy nuances. I do know, you know, this, this is like the approach that seems to come up forever and, and nobody's taken a big bite of the apple yet. It's like, how does a land bank play a role in, in facilitating a land trust or some other mechanism whereby the ownership can move into a more um, regulated community kind of ownership. And so, you know, there may be opportunities for that. It seems like they're perennial and always there. I just kind of bring it up as one of these options where, you know, if we're thinking about land banks owning residential property, like, but maybe the hesitancy is they don't want to do it forever, you know, and get into the full management of that. Like, what are the possible handoff opportunities to kind of shape, shape a vehicle on the other side that could take control of it, but, but land banks could, could play a role in the, like in, in the flow of it. So I'll just mention that that's something that comes to mind, but again, not a practitioner or a policy person on that level. Jerry, also yeah. like you said, that, oh, sorry, that um, the housing and people are so different, right? So when you're talking about a structure, you're not talking about how, um, someone's quality of life and if there's an emergency or anything like that you know traditionally we work eight to five and monday through friday and just thinking through that but i do think there are creative partnerships that can allow us to work with others uh to to work through that yeah no i think that's great and just from uh from hamilton county's perspective um one of the things that we've started to do more research on is just you know what what apartment buildings are out there that we could help acquire. So not necessarily getting into the rental game yet, but at least being the conduit to working with, you know, um, good developers, good, good small scale, large scale developers to actually get more apartment buildings online. I know in Hamilton County, um, there's been a lot of research done to kind of put a number to how many vacant units, I believe it's close to 40,000 vacant units um, in Hamilton County. And so how do you match those up with people who need housing is something that it's a big conversation that we're, we're a part of here in Hamilton County. Um, Quickly, I'm just going to put up our contact information just so you all can have that if you want to email us directly. Uh, but I do want to highlight, someone asked the question, is there any example from Summit County? Um, and there's an answer here in the chat that Summit County just approved a 6.2 million grant project to assist Summit County residents with rental and mortgage assistance, utility assistance, eviction prevention, et cetera. It was just past Monday. So that's, that's pretty huge. Um, that's a really neat initiative. So um, kudos to Summit County for, for getting involved with that. That, that sounds really great. Mm -hmm. If I could just say something about that, the um, my understanding is they had allocated some some funds earlier and then you know got hit hard with requests. Um, so it's great that they revisited it and are putting money back in. I do think we're going to hear an announcement, uh, maybe even this week yet, from the state about some movement around emergency rental assistance. So just stay tuned on that. Hopefully, we'll have some good news. And one of the things I'll just mention on here, I know we're wrapping up, um, you know, some of the data sets that I mentioned, like the, the property tax delinquency and the, uh, the stream of like mortgage foreclosure risk. I just have, I have a feeling like my sense of the vibe is that sometimes that information feels like very far away. And like, how would I actually like get that? Um, I mean, for property tax delinquency, there are a handful of counties in Ohio where that information is already just kind of accessible through the county. Um, I believe the Montgomery County is one where you can actually access like a stream of the tax delinquency at the address level. But otherwise it's, it's, it's really just a conversation away with the treasurer or the appropriate party. I say just, I know sometimes, you know, there's always the why, why do you want this? But that's information that land banks should be able to get, you know, if they contact that appropriate um, uh, office. And then one thing I'll just mention, if it's interesting, I mentioned the, the mortgage foreclosure data from, from CoreLogic and, um, you know, I did navigate quite a few conversations to kind of get it an answer for how that would work. And it's something you can follow up with me and Jerry, Jerry at landgrid.com about it if you'd like. It's, it's actually fairly affordable for 12 snapshots over the course of the year at the address level. And, and CoreLogic did express interest if, if the association were interested in like a group buy for that. It ends up being like, hundreds of dollars per land bank for everyone to get a full year of snapshots. And so it could be, if, if anybody's interested, I mean, definitely let me know. I'll try to connect some dots on those things. But I just, 
I want to help make that achievable because usually they're only in like the aggregate. And I feel like people give up on thinking that they can actually get that. So. All right. Well, I think that's our time. Um, I just want to thank again our, our panel. Um, just very honored to be on this panel with you all. So thank you all for your time, Jerry, Frank, Bill, Ann. Um, I think right now we'll be taking a break. And so I think we'll see everyone back at 1010.